Good to see you here and hello everyone online. Today I'm going to talk about multicultural environmental participation and the potential of access to archives. Now, this is a very much a thinking aloud presentation. We're right at the beginning of the journey, which I think is always very interesting. Now, how do we get there? The whole point is that we've been around for a long time. We started in 1987. A lot of people have not been born in 1987. I'm now 73. So it's been a long track. And when I first started it, I remember one of my old friends saying to me, Jindy, do you want to change the world? If you do, first thing you've got to do is live a long time because things change very slowly. And it is really true. And the terminology changes and so on. And the most stable terminology that I've used is multicultural environmental participation. And I think this is very important. Ben uses the word black symbolically, recognizing that black communities are the most visible of all ethnic groups. And we work with white, black, and other ethnic communities. Now, this is interesting. People think that in the days we started, the term was ethnic minorities, and people felt that that reflected a certain category. But we never ever drew boundaries around it. If you come to us and you are white and you say, I am an ethnic minority, we will not challenge it. Because being an ethnic minority is actually an experience we're talking about. Not a category, but an experience of neglect and of exclusion. And later on, of course, these words are the words that came forward. Excluded communities, neglected communities. Those are the features you talk about that are important because many ethnic minorities are not excluded as well. So this kind of talking about why we are here and what we're doing is extremely important. And Ben has always said, we are a network of individuals and organizations working for change, which meant surprisingly to a lot of people, a lot of mainstream, predominantly white organizations of goodwill. They were actually part of the network. And this is how you build change that you welcome people of the same mind and of goodwill to work together. So how do we start talking about archives? It was through an invitation to join something called the Places, Plants and People Archive Network, coming from leaders like Q, Botanic Gardens and so on. They wanted something more. They wanted something more to happen with archives than this notion of ordinary people saying, oh, archives are somewhere you just a stick in the room and it stays there forever. And Daniel wouldn't like that. Daniel was very keen on this little gallery where he shows things and the relevance of things and begin to involve people who we nowadays call target audiences. Yeah, we try to get at these people. But the network brings together a diverse group of archives of holdings on living landscapes, plants, and their place in communities and provides a forum for them to connect in a meaningful and sustainable way. So the connections might include, but not limited to holdings of botanical, agricultural, horticultural archives, records of community gardens, landscape preservation, landscape architecture, land management, as well as the broader documentation of socio-cultural perspectives and heritage. Now, this is really interesting because it means that besides people saying, oh, this is what we've got, we're trying to see, but what about ways of seeing? Things change when you look at them in different ways and frame them in different ways. So by coming together, we have this aspiration that we will be more than we were and that we also have aspirations of people coming up with inspirational ideas, including from our target audiences, and so on, who say, hey, what about doing you know, an, a little exhibition of plants? And perhaps people who come to the exhibition, you collect information about what they think of these plants. And perhaps their own stories. And storytelling has become such a current theme of tapping into the reality of where people actually are. For example, I was working on the steering group of the Woodlands Trust, which decided as a stimulus to planting trees and so on, to reinvent an 800 year old charter and write a new tree charter for today. And the way it did, did it was through storytelling. The consultant who worked on it was so clever. He says, you know, everyone already loves trees. 
The problem is they love trees when it's in the back of their minds. How do you bring it to the front of their minds? And the solution was get them to tell a story of their own about what impressed them about a tree and experience in their childhood, the experience or an encounter in their adulthood about trees that impressed them. It brings it to the front of their minds. And once you do that, it creates an interest. And out of doing that, what they did was they collected 60,000 personal stories about trees. And then they put it to a program of keywords. And from the keywords, they wrote the tree charter. But even more clever than that, after they wrote the tree charter, they gave it to an expert who could turn it into everyday language. So that the tree charter has simple, direct language that ordinary people can understand. So all these processes of connection means that people were very interested. They wanted to find out about trees. They wanted to know what they could do to protect them, the beauty where they could experience trees and so on. And out of that, they formed over 500 new groups. Can you imagine? People wanted to form groups all over the UK. They called them tree charter branches and the Woodland Trust supports them with free trees to give away to plant and expertise on trees that might, you might want if you talk to your community group and so on. But you can see how the process had come such a long way from the times when policy was imposed and organizations did things that actually were done to the community. We now have this enormous atmosphere of engagement. And this is part of why such a network arises. This awareness that there's a trend now in society of involvement and engagement and certain parts of community coming forward very strongly. You know, I have seen in 1987 when Ben first started, when we talked about ethnic minorities, the mainstream organizations said, what? what, who are you talking about? And then we said, well, you haven't got any ethnic minorities in the movement. And they sort of said, well, why don't they just come then? as if it would just happen just like that. So we took them on an enormous journey where we had in those days, minorities who never left the city, they came to very poor jobs in the city, doing things like sweeping the floor in factories and things like that. And to go into the countryside was actually too expensive as well. And, and also, where do you go? When you look in your own history, how do you have a relationship to nature and the countryside through your family? Your memories as a child of your parents taking you by the hand, walking in the woodland, enjoying yourself and so on. And very often research tells us that the most devoted environmentalists have childhood experiences that really impressed them and formed a relationship. And that relationship carries not just connection of nature, but in context, that is this warm feeling of family being there when you connect with nature as well. And you carry that on with your own children. So, so your first places that you visit were your parents' favorite places. Now, ethnic minorities coming in from nowhere, if no one taking any, any interest in them, well, where would they go? So we started to construct the process of this whole thing of talking quite differently about going into nature. Because in 1987, the environmental sector was a very different creature from what it is nowadays. They were only interested in people who wanted to work for nature. So it was all people for nature. We brought in another factor. We talked about nature for people, which for them was very strange to say, what do you mean? So for example, when we first suggested taking people very often for the first time into the countryside to a nature reserve, some of the organizations who work with their managers says, you mean we, you want us to take them for a jaunt without doing any volunteering? And we said, well, they have never even seen the place. So you have to start with this very, very ordinary process, which after 30 years of participation, I can collapse the whole process into two phrases. We love what we enjoy. We protect what we love. But if you've never seen the thing, how can you love it? How can you understand it? How can it, you feel that there's a sense of belonging and you want to protect it and therefore unlock the fast missing contribution to the environment that comes out of a very, very ordinary 
human process. So these are the things that we actually talk about, the benefits of contact and enjoyment, and of course, all the things in those days that government wants and talk about quality of life, and then access to knowledge and experience to contribute to the care and protection of nature. And of course, nowadays, right up to the minute now, access to green jobs. So these things are very, very topical at the moment. So some of the things when we thought about archives, is the first thing you thought, think about archives is all sort of concrete things, bits of paper, posters, books, records, and, and so on. But I also thought that we should actually work harder and talk about the whole track record and perhaps putting down new things to be archived or frameworks and ways of seeing. Because one of the things Ben did was create new vocabulary in the language. as so well, new ways of seeing that frames the looking forward into a vision of what environmental participation could be for multicultural communities. So this is our first initiative, very simple. The countryside is also ours. How emotional this is, I think most people do not get nowadays. We had community groups who lived in the urban areas, working in the urban areas, very poor, had never been taken into countryside for 30 years. Had never seen the sea at all, never went to the coast. And when we took them to those places, and this is the wonderful thing about nature, the echoes of experience. That actually there are people living in Sheffield who insist that the woodlands look like the ones in the Congo, or people going to Margate and danced on the cliffs and say, this is what it is like in Turkey. So there were all sorts of memories and people began to tell stories and so on about themselves and share experiences. So this was the very first step of getting the environmental sector to say that they will use some of their resources like organizations of minibuses. Just let people have a minibus, go into a countryside and also taking the trouble to create an interesting and positive first experience. So if you go to a nature reserve and so on, you know, if you went as a group by yourself, you wouldn't know where to go, where the most beautiful things are. And you also might go and look at a bunch of plants looking at you very ugly, but botanically very important plants. What are you looking at? Now, why is it important? What is happening? And so on. all these things are things of interest once you engage and think that I can be part of this. So one of the things you always tell the environmental sector is the first thing, and sometimes the only things that makes a breakthrough in what we call creating an entry point is a welcome in the countryside. And that is not as easy as you think. Now you can create welcomes very easily by working with specific organizations, go to their nature reserves, their welcoming staff, their rangers as well, welcome them. But if you went into a local village, it'll be a different story. Yeah. So some groups tried to return and do this by themselves and went to villages and so on and had very racist experiences. Whereas their positive experience in the environmental sector was really the anchoring and the starting point for all our work. So we've come a long way. We're not a square one. We now got a database of over 100 new generation. We now have minority activists with their own voices, very much encouraging us to go in many diverse experiences and linking into the world, into the countries of heritage. So attention to the human process. So these are the things, the concepts and ways of seeing that we put forward to help people to understand how to do this and what to do. So this one, for example, we said at the very beginning and it's still even now very powerful. There's no such thing as a purely environmental initiative. A so-called purely environmental initiative is one that has rejected its social, cultural, and economic context. And within the cultural is spiritual. A lot of people don't think about it, but even the Christian churches and so on, to pray for the environment is activism. And it focuses your mind and your intent to do what you want to do in the life. And historically, and, and the, the members of the plants, places and people network were very conscious. This is one of the consciousness 
that is rising in the groups and they're doing projects to track the history that goes with the plants that are here because the movements of plants follow the movement of people. As simple as that. So you look at the plants, entire history comes forward that you can track and make it come to life. So we are thinking about doing exhibitions with people like Kew Botanic Gardens and, and so on, coming together and tracking the history of different communities and then we're su supplementing with personal stories of how people arrive, what they missed when they arrived, what they make connections with. For example, the Royal Horticultural Society and so on, you used to have a very remarkable information giving service where instead of just giving you identification of plants and so on, for our network, especially, he was called Adrian. I can't remember his last name. He said, if someone rings us up and said, in my childhood, I remember this plant in my country. It looks like this is, can you tell me what it is? And can I grow it here? He would say, he would find out if you can grow it here, well and good. If you can't, he tells you the next plant that looks like that one, which I thought was a tremendous way to respond to people and to respect what losses they have and what they would like to connect to. And who we are and what we achieve depends on how others see us against the enormous pressure of how we see ourselves against the enormous pressure of how others see us. This is true for everyone. You experience it when you go for a job interview, but this is particularly strongly felt by minorities. So the two pillars of sustainable development are the relationship of people to nature and then the relationship of people to each other. And that's where the multiculturalism and identification is really, really important. And I would actually like to say to you that climate change is the failure of these two relationships. Because if we love nature enough, we would never have damaged it the way we do. And if we love people enough, we would not damage them. And the two are highly interlinked, especially with colonialism and the destruction of forests and resources and still going on. You're having cheap chicken feeding on soya that's now grown in the Amazon and cutting down trees in the Amazon. So people and nature intrinsically together and changes are coming together, thinking, feeling, and action. So important because without feeling, we're not motivated to do anything, but without the proper thinking of knowing things about the details of things, you might do things that are absolutely wrong. And then, of course, the motivation and the feeling that we can take action is all important. And that's why the welcome in the environmental sector is so important, because we need specialist organizations. One thing needs to be clear. Black and My Network is about participation. We have no specialist knowledge about the environment. We can't identify plants for you. We can't tell you exactly what to do to, to save certain plants, endangered species and so on. You have to go to the specialist organizations in the environmental sector. That's why we always say that the real outcome we want is the outreach and the confidence and the relationship building with ethnic minorities is set in the mainstream organizations. They have to do it. Then we too have access to everything that we actually need. And we also create new words. We created the, the idea that the local ethnic minorities are actually global majority populations. And this is now in the language in many magazines and so on. And then this also repositions people, for example, at the global stakeholders um, group and so on. This was really important because again, the recognition of numbers in different places and their relationships and how in this country, if you work well with ethnic minorities, it lays down the basis to work well with global majorities. And the very, very dominant white countries like the UK, although it's very small and the US and so on, are big players in the world. So their ability to connect well and to work well is part of our future. So these are some of the things we've done. I've just uh, talked about it. I've listed it, Crane, Antipoint, the, the discussion about what is native and non-native. And we were part of formulating with the biosecurity department, 
the language of this. When we first started, it used to be native and alien. And they wanted to officially use the words native and non-native because it doesn't bring in the emotive and the emotive sort of um, vocabulary that belongs in immigration, which is native and alien. So this was a softer way of doing things. So all these things have come a long way. Hidden history is a term that's now used that we coin. Cultural visions of nature, which is how different countries look at and relate to nature. For example, when I was in Mexico, you know, wandering around in the main square next to a cathedral, there were lots of, of Mexican groups dancing in all their feathers and everything right next to the cathedral. And I went up and asked them, why are you dancing next to the cathedral? And they said, well, you know, they can't build all their churches on cathedral on our sacred land. So if we dance next to cathedral, we're dancing on our sacred land. And when I said this at a British conference, a Morris dancer came, came up to me and she said, oh, people have forgotten, you needed this here to the pagan communities and all over Europe. So maybe I too should be dancing next to the churches. So, all these things are lists and so on about our methodology using storytelling. So I won't go into this because it would take too long. But it's all there. It's very obvious when you read it. So when you get the PowerPoint as a PDF, you can go into some of this yourself without needing me to talk about any of it. So influencing policy and practice, what documents you have? These are some of the documents we have. With, uh, For example, one of them was actually published by the Heritage Lottery Fund. And we depend a lot, I must acknowledge, people of goodwill who are white, who understand issues and who are in places of power and they do things to change things. So Simon Alding in the Heritage Lottery Fund, when he was running it, he commissioned a paper from us so that we could talk about these issues. And the other thing he did that was very clever was that you know everything is evidence-based. So when you applied in those days, decades ago now, to the Heritage Lottery Fund and so on. They want evidence of, you say you are so small numbers and people are not getting, they say, well, where is the evidence? And we didn't have any. So what did he do? HLF commissioned the evidence. So they did a piece of research. So when you apply, you use their piece of evidence in order to apply. Now, this is the way the mainstream can really help, to notice things that can actually raise knowledge and experience and allow people to be part of the mainstream by removing the barriers. This is Power Place, which was the review to set forward a way of thinking for the entire heritage sector into the future. And we were part of that group and produced the writing for that. And for the first time, you can see on the cover, a black face, amazing for a policy document. Yeah? So these are some of the pages from it. And then we worked with people like English Heritage and, and Duncan um, McCallum was, was a really keen person working with us as a policy officer. I always remember he was so excited. He came to me, Jenny, Jenny, we got two words in. It's going to make all the difference in the world. It is community value. So now when the developers actually come in, they have to demonstrate community value. And he says it was a step change when that actually happens. And this, we had a chapter in that in which the, the word hidden histories was coined. And then we have files of this, of articles and so on appearing in other people's magazines, in the newspapers, and so on. And, and some of them are very, very interesting. One of the documents we have was, was when um, the BBC rang us up and, and said um, the, the uh, very popular program in, in the countryside, they, they said, you know, should they actually have ethnic minority groups in the programs? I said, of course, because nearly every village has three key takeaways, Chinese, Indian, and Turkish. <laughs> So they should be seen, if nothing else, if there are no residents, at least there are people in the takeaways. And this led to a nationwide two-week debate, can you imagine, on the radio and the newspapers by, by me just saying that. So these sort of records are, are actually very interesting as well about what goes on in debate and, and so on. So these are many of the pages and so on from, from magazines. We wrote chapters in magazines and 
and so on that are now part of our archives. We're now developing what should be in our archives and can we create more archives as well? And then of course, there are also publications from key organizations when they were very keen that did their organizations publish. For example, the Federation of City Farms and Community Gardens, they published Chilis and Roses about how to involve communities in gardens. And, and then the then countryside uh, Wales actually commissioned us to write things for them about various methods and guidelines and so on. The National Trust published whose story? And then the, the City Hall in London published Sowing the Seeds and so on. So there are many of these documents and so on really tracking what is important that has been published. And then chapters in influential publications, the most recent ones, like the Urban Ecology Handbook, I have two chapters in that, talking about multicultural and environmental participation. And all these are other ones. These are the international ones that we've been writing for. And then our own publications and reports. And I was having a nice, interesting conversation about how academia recognize or not recognize the validity of statements that are made by ordinary people in reports that are current and so on. Because many of these things that we wrote were up to the minute and very, very important currently and so on, but are seen by many academics as not contextualized enough, not validated enough, so they don't take any notice of it. But if you actually look backwards in time, then you see the outcomes and the context later on. So they have to become part of our archives so that academics can see the historical rise of certain ideas and outcomes and, and so on. So these are collections of articles and discussion papers. Instead of just articles, we, we developed something very interesting called discussion papers, because what we, we said was really important is that people don't stay, just write about things they're really confident about that has already happened, but put into the arena, things are being discussed and not concluded. So putting the subject matter and the issues forward and various perspectives, not saying this is it, but this is part of it, was for us one of the most important things that we did. We call them discussion papers. And a lot of these were discussion papers. And then we publish very particular things about green spaces, about linking heritage. It was that really funny photograph of that child with <laughs> very long sleeves. And um, we have a bank of examples of good practice. So then we've, had, we've got about 80 of them where we actually, very simple, two pages, nice photographs. And then we just talk about what we did, how much it cost, what were the main aims, what were the main outcomes, and the key points of why this project was important. So good practice, here you see some of them. And uh, uh, this is going way back. If you're old enough, you have heard of overhead projector slides instead of PowerPoints. <laughs> you have to be very old to have seen that. But we have them, and it's interesting because you see the evolving vocabulary as well as we track things. When I looked at some of them, I said, oh my, my goodness, we said that in those days. Yeah. And uh, so on. And this is one of the, the projects we did and, and so on. And there are stories still being captured. I think that is very important. As we look through the archives, I think we'll see that the people like me getting very old now who still remember things. The things are not captured. And then perhaps conversations with very young ones it would be very interesting. So, and then all sorts of very, very confident minorities come up, like Joe Cena and so on, who says that if you are not going to talk about reparation, I'm not going to talk to you goodbye. <laughs> yeah, we demand it. This is the context within which we're moving forward now. So they're, they're very confident people pushing issues and so on, not just saying them, but pushing them now and claiming that we want land in the countryside. We have a passion and we want to farm and so on. And on the right hand side is, is Adam with the first halal farm in the UK doing very sustainable work and a real model. Refugees planting trees in Scotland and 
in sea people, I think one of the things that when we started that we realized we had no images of people from minorities doing things. When we first collected the first set of 10 photographs of minority doing things, it was a step change in our outreach into communities. And we also gave those packs to environmental organizations in the white mainstream as well. Because when you go in and show minorities, look what they're doing, look, they say, they say my goodness, people like us are doing this. You know, people like us are present in the nature. So if they can do it, we can do it. That was a step change. To have that stack of first images was a real breakthrough. And, you know, although I say that we've come a long way, we must remember that ethnic minorities as a term is a moving target. There are new people arriving all the time and less and less welcome. So where is the first welcome? You know, the whole process is a chain when you involve people. And the first step, you fail at the first rung, the whole thing is gone. Besides that, any step in the chain, one broken link, the whole thing falls. So that is the nature of participation. So catering staff going out and enjoying themselves and being so proud they come in their best clothes when we invite them out, which was sometimes not a good idea. <laughs> So these things were a learning process and how we brief people when they come into the countryside is don't put on your best clothes. Please don't come in your best high heels because you will break your ankles going into the countryside. Enjoy yourselves. And then we had a problem. People were so poor that they didn't have old clothes to go into the countryside, you know? So all these sort of things were, were real issues. But we have come a long way in recognition of cultural presence, a sense of belonging, people putting money into restoring cultural heritage in local parks and so on. We felt to be a big thing by minorities, a recognition of presence. And then investing in, in the areas around social housing, huge spaces of derelict land, you can produce a wonderful grand scale, not just a flower bed, but grand scale that you see of wildflowers and so on, really emotional and joyous thing to do. And then people do things off their own bed. It all doesn't always cost money. People can do things and, and people have done things like in, in um, London boroughs where the local authority is actually very flexible. Some local authorities is really harsh. If you plant something in a tree pit, you'll find that it's, it's torn up straight away. In, in the next week, but in some of them, they allow you to plant in tree pits and don't mind if you pick up the old paving stone and plant plants and so on. And this is one of the areas which is really large done by local people, planting things over some 30 years and becomes like a, a forest in the, in the streets of London. And these, this is a very ordinary street, but there's so many trees and things, you can hardly see the buildings, the climbers on the walls as well. And this is what I say, you know, in a residential street where if there are any cars, they are your own, the pedestrians are your family and friends, it's really your street, you can claim it, you can make it look like this. If everybody did this, we can become much more of an urban forest than we are now. And the idea of the urban forest is about the canopy, but this tells you the urban forest has a forest floor. So what can we do in the spaces do we have? So many different things coming together, uh, people in different places, creating woodlands. And I talked about the Mexicans. And then here on the left, I talk about the origin of bonsai, the different cultural visions of nature and how people get into contact with nature. So one of the ideas is, is that with these sort of the standard plants we call bonsai, it is our idea of contact with the wilderness of nature in you know, one plant. And it's inspired by these stunted plants clinging onto the cliffside, but becoming perfect plants that look very noble in their struggle with nature, the idea of nobility as well. So the arts, we know all about that, and trilingual reports, and then in, in areas where people are growing food, such an emotional for my, emotional thing for minorities, use of the arts and how we bless nature by doing beautiful artworks, which when we finish, we actually sweep away. 
So there's no materialistic clinging onto the work that's devoted to nature. And then the imagined use of materials, you know, we're really boring nowadays in contemporary architecture. But look at this in Bali. And with the local conditions, they don't need windows. It's made of bamboo. And when you walk around in this building, it actually moves under your feet. So that's it. I've talked for a long time, probably longer than I should have. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, for that lovely presentation. It was, it was wonderful to see all of the images and, and learn about the history. I'm uh, My name is Tanya Martin, and I'm just going to sort of speak with Judy a little bit about her presentation, and then we'll open it up to everyone to introduce themselves and ask questions. Um, so one of the things that I sort of, that struck me in your presentation throughout and, and you know, what you were speaking about and the way you were speaking was kind of the emphasis on pleasure, joy, fun in the environmental movement. And I think that there's often a sense that environmental movements are sort of about depressing stuff and like <laughs> tackling very difficult issues. And I'm wondering if that was sort of a conscious effort in trying to bring in questions of pleasure and fun and enjoyment into sort of thinking about the environment. Yes, I mean, the clue is what I said about the human process and how if you track the most enthusiastic environmentalists, it goes back to pleasure in early life and intimate connections with the beauty of nature and wanting to protect it. And of course, over the decades, we've destroyed so much more. You know, even in London, if I look at London in the 70s, it's nothing like it is now. I mean, the degree of pollution and the traffic and so on is absolutely terrible. We actually had real rush hours in the 70s in London, you know, and after that, the traffic quieted down and, and so on. So all these things are, are really important to, to notice. And I think that the other thing about it is that a lot of the groups we were working with had very, very hard lives. And the fact that there are beautiful places, including in, in urban areas, because in, in urban areas, to have the privilege of a local green space, to have, you know, in London, that we actually have woodlands, we actually have ancient woodlands within reach and, and so on. All these things, once you're introduced to it as yours, not just something out there, but as yours. And people didn't know, it's, it's so sad because, for example, in Scotland, we worked in Edinburgh and we got the, the parks people, one of the rather large parks, to take ethnic minorities around the park and show them what there was. They actually had not seen what all the parks had to offer. And to actually meet the manager who was the program manager and think that you're in touch with the program manager and you can actually ask to do something in the park. These were the things that made a huge difference to have an ordinary meeting sitting on the grass instead of in a meeting room. All these things make such an impact on the quality of people's lives that we were also reimagining ourselves as much as possible. How can we actually make this something so positive that the fact that you also had to face all the bad things and make the efforts to change these things are balanced. For example, we had a little group in Edinburgh, a very small group, newly formed of multicultural women. And when they found out about us and we took them on trips to Edinburgh Botanic Gardens or Seaside and so on, you know what they told? They said, you know, all ethnic groups are formed out of deprivation and trouble. We form these groups <clears throat> to solve problems. And when we meet, it is very miserable. The whole agenda is just absolutely heavy. And she says that when we came across you and then had this program of enjoyment for our groups, we increased the number of members. And we also, as a group, felt that we did nice things together as well as approach problems. So there are human and social dimensions are really important. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree. And it shows in, in the work. Um, one other thing that I think um, sort of you've taken us through a long period of Ben's sort of involvement in environmental uh, action in the UK. And I'm wondering how you sort of see 
shifts within the UK environmental movement over time, not just in terms of sort of more representation, as you mentioned, but also in, in the kind of vocabulary, the kind of ways in which people are thinking about nature, what, what has shifted and what, what needs to shift even further. In 1987, as I said, it was all about people for nature. Never mind ethnic minorities, the environmental sector was not even interested in people. Even if you were a white person, unless you wanted to volunteer, they were not interested in you. So the idea of catering for people in the environmental sector was sort of revolutionary. But as they began to see how it was working, they also recognized that this was happening to other disadvantaged groups, including white poor people on council. So they also never went anywhere. They also had very hard lives. They also had no access, all this sort of thing. So a lot of our methodology then began to, from the attention, the original intention of bringing in ethnic minorities, opened up a conversation of, who else is there that's not included? So when organizations groundwork, you know, BTCB in those days and, and so on, began to address the fact that they needed to be more inclusive. So it actually, by through our work, we actually started a kind of sea change of what participation is. So instead of people for nature, it was also nature for people, two-way street. Yeah, and they saw that it worked. So there was a missing contribution that you have because you can have only so many devoted volunteers beyond which actually it doesn't go up beyond a certain point. Who are the ones who are not included? You can have more volunteers. And then also the element of enjoyment and so on was extremely important so that people began to do multifaceted projects instead of just projects to come and volunteer, it came. And then you had enjoyment, you had storytelling, you did art, you did all sorts of things. You also celebrated people and nature. So we started off something that was really important, which is the socio-cultural environmental vision of participation. And groundwork and people like that, they copied the methodology to work with other disadvantaged groups, people with disability and so on, who also need other kinds of developments on the grounds and so on to cater for them. But the attitude that you can actually include people and that they will contribute and they will also gain from their lives is something we really gave the environment to set. And what, what do you think needs to be done for them going forward? Well, moving forward, yeah, other things that come up as, as you as you first of all, you're participating, you're part of the enjoyment is really important. You learn things, become part of lives and so on. But then, of course, all the questions then which have really arrived now, so that you've got language like people talk about EDI. You know? <laughs> and then you say EDI, and people understand what it actually stands for: equality, diversity, and inclusion. And so on. So it becomes part of the language and part of the culture that you're expected to do this now. When we first started, people did it out of goodwill. We went to them and they said, oh, they will do that and so on. And a lot of, there was also a lot of resistance and there was racism inside organizations. Always remember Chris Baines in, in one of the conversations of me. He said, GD, you don't know how many rows you caused us in, in meetings in the wildlife trust. The people were fighting, saying, why do we work with these people? Why don't they just come? What's the matter with them? And all this other stuff. Instead of seeing that, that especially in those days, the way the isolation was much more extreme. It's not like that now. We've moved a long way, you know? And even London, the isolation was not like you know, it is today. Today we, we mix comfortably. A lot of people really like being multicultural in London and so on. Whereas in, in London in the 70s and 60s, there was racism in a way that was very uncomfortable. So we have moved as a society, and the opportunities and part of what we did also helped to create opportunities so that the environmental sector, in a way, became way ahead of other sectors in terms of involving minorities. For example, if I went, I remember going to a local authority meeting and uh, they wanted me to say something about Black environmental network and, and uh, someone who was a politician stood up and said, 
groups like this should not exist. How dare they separate themselves off like that? And I said, we're already separated. We formed a group in order to put ourselves back. You know, but there were very aggressive people as well, especially in the political arena and so on. But the, the environmental sector, when you looked at all the sector, was this, all the different sectors, was a very soft sector. They had ideals, a lot of ideals that were global because they had to deal with global things and so on. And, and they understood certain things that were actually ahead of other sectors. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating to hear hear that trajectory. I wanted to just quickly come to um, a question on archives specifically, since that's sort of the topic um, for today. And, you know, as you said, we often think of archives as sort of dusty old files in a library or an office. And I'm wondering, when we're thinking about sort of focusing on the environment or plants as archives in themselves, how does that sort of reconstitute what is an archive, who has access to an archive, um, and how we might read something like a plant or a landscape as an archive? Well, it's like in the beginning, one of the things about organizations we said to when you talk about participation, look at your own image. What is your image in society? Your image brings you the people you deserve. <laughs> in, in a way. So if archivists are not designing exhibition of archives that make people really excited and then people end up with images of dusty archives in, in whatever. So it's, you might have even more very interesting archive exhibitions, but nobody might have heard of them. Of them. You know, there are all these stages of participation and exposure, which forms a public image of what do you do with this stuff? You know, can we use it, for example? You know, can an ordinary person go to the archives and know how to ask the right questions and look for things that they may want or have advice about things they may want? I want an exhibition over this period of time, you know, what is there in an archive? So the, the coming alive of archives, I think, has to be this consciousness of archives themselves saying, who are we actually for? Are we for academics in 30 years time? Are we for people now? Are we for people who want to look back? Are we for people who want to look back in order to decide who they are now? and take themselves into the future. Can we learn from the past? What did these people do? And what did people collect? For example, as, as I said, you know, when I looked at what we had in some boxes, I thought to myself, maybe we didn't make enough of, of being aware that tracking our policy might be one really interesting facet. They are on this, they are not in a book. They are not in an article. You know, they, so they are not in, in our discussion papers, but that would be, be really interesting. Or even environmental organizations, you know, do they have copies of how their policy evolved? Or have they thrown them all away? <laughs> all these things, when you start asking these things, is what interests who? Yeah. You know, and... Uh, and what about some people want to take credit? What about organizations who did, had this fabulous development of policies that you could see and they could look at and say, look what we did, you know? And, uh, and of course, some organizations have policies which show that they didn't do anything. <laughs> so all these things are, when you go into a different group of people, so you go to a group of a person like me, because I'm now very much in committees and things like that. How interesting in the minutes of committees, a change in policy. And what happened culturally? What happened to people's lives when that actually happened? And then those people being interested, and perhaps from an exhibition, an archive exhibition, can you imagine young people being interested in policy? because they can see, wow, you know, this is interesting stuff. It's not as boring as you think. After they did this, this happened. 
So what can we do in order to change the things that we want in our society now so we can get what we want? Mm -hmm. So these are different energies that we think when we talk to different organizations and so on. And, and I'll also begin to talk to some minority groups say, saying, you know, what things do you keep? You know, what do you think is interesting about your organization? What have you changed? And have you documented that? How would you show it? Should it become an archive? Should you give it to some organization who wants to help you create one? Yeah. No, I, mean, I, I think your archive that you sort of gave us a glimpse into is just absolutely fascinating. And I hope it's used publicly and sort of displayed. Well, I would um, see yeah. the library is at the moment going to go into discussion with us whether they're going to keep our archives. Okay. So that, that would be an interesting development if we do that. Absolutely. <laughs> I was interested. And also when, when, when the idea was raised, I was also interested because I didn't want to go into a typical place. The other thing is, where does your archive go? Does it go into a university? Do, do we, because we're a Black Environment Network, think we should go into the Black National Archives? Or is it really interesting to have it in a mainstream organization? And I also thought about the economics side of it, because the idea of colonialism is on the economic structures that we're now struggling with as a legacy and so on, which is part of changing the world. So it's sort of so interesting to be in a place where, where there's a, sort of an edge about wanting to know certain things. Right, I think that, and that, that's a great sort of segue into one of my last questions, I promise I'll stop um, very soon, which is to talk a little bit more about as you said, sort of the history of colonialism and enslavement that can often be read in these archives. So for instance, you you know, you talked about the people, plants, places, network. I, know that. <laughs> uh, uh, I might have got it mixed up. I, but yeah, yeah. And, and also, you know, with Kew Gardens right here in London, and there's been in the last couple of years quite a lot of discussion and controversy around the history of Kew Gardens and its connections to colonialism um, and appropriation of plants and, and things like that. So I'm wondering, um, you know, how you see plants as not just being sort of something that people can enjoy and, and sort of um, have aesthetic value, which is why many people go to Kew Gardens, for example, but also tell these kind of uncomfortable histories which not everyone wants to hear or to be heard. So I'm just- Yes, yeah, so I think we're going through a very important transformational period of history at the moment. I mean, in the UK now, many large organizations are doing research into their own history. Yeah, Q is doing it. And uh, lots of universities are doing it and so on because it's no longer acceptable. You reach a sort of point where society says, hey guys, we had enough of this. Can we have some honesty? Can we and I remember the year when we had the 200th anniversary of the abolition of transatlantic slavery. I had major museums ringing me up and say, if we put on the exhibition about this history, the question was, will they hate us more? Yeah. And I said to them, it is the reverse. Because by the way you interpret and show this history, and if you actually want to move beyond it, the way you do it will draw a line and say, this organization is about the future. We're not stuck in there still acting like the slavers and wanting to hide it. Because when you hide it, people think, well, you haven't changed. That's why you're hiding it. That is the most direct response from anybody. So if you're willing to show it and to discuss it, it means you belong to the group that has moved on. So it puts you in a good light. It doesn't burden you. You're much more burdened when people actually think badly of you. And the, the way things are coming out and so on, you know, conversations are be being had. And of course, this conversation that we're having now poses really important and really difficult challenges because it really challenges us to change the entire way 
that we relate to the former colonial uh, countries and so on, and to recognize the legacy inside all the economic system that are still there. You know, we might not enslave people anymore in terms of taking them to another country and physically make them slaves, but economically, there's still many people being enslaved. So these questions are really, really true. And of course, you know, when we start, you have these phenomena that, that you see that, that people are simplistic. They talk about race. So at many conferences, if they're looking for one speaker, especially a young activist, they try to look for a black one. Yeah, the black ones first, and then perhaps the Asian ones. So black and brown is a new term <laughs> as well. And then it makes all the minority minorities feel, where are we then? You know, do we also have a history and the relationship? What are the people from Hong Kong? You know, all, all those other places and so on. Our histories are not visible. So at the moment, and we must recognize that people can only move at a certain pace. So I say, let them get on with it. Let them get on with the black history stuff until they're exhausted. And then perhaps they will go into indentured labor and start talking about that. And then they will talk about other things and then they will gradually complete the picture. But these things are all awarenesses of what is happening. And when you're in touch with minority groups, then you know the feelings that it still en engenders, although the door is now open. It's a very emotionally charged thing of whether we're included or excluded. Yeah, that's a great sort of point to sort of thank you so much. a little bit. And yeah, thank you so much. And